Hi, good morning everybody. Thanks for coming today. It's cold in this room. The heat is not on. It's very, very cold today. Anyway, today I'm going to talk to you for 10 minutes about Coca-Cola. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Okay, Coca-Cola was invented by a man called John Pemberton. Now, John Pemberton, he fought in the American Civil War and he was injured in the war. And like many people that were injured after the war, he started taking morphine for his pain and he became addicted to the morphine, as happened quite a lot. Now, he wanted to wean himself off this morphine. He wanted to fight his addiction and he wanted to create a new drink to help himself do that. At the time, there were a lot of medicines appearing, a lot of new medicines. These were not real medicines. They were tonics made with different kinds of ingredients and they were supposed to help different things. Um, they were made by quack doctors or snake oil salesmen. Um, the word quack, quack doctor, comes from the Dutch uh, quack salver, which means someone who boasts about their selves, medicines. And snake oil salesmen, I think it comes from uh, snake oil is actually supposed to be quite good for you. And people were selling medicines labeled as snake oil that didn't actually have any snake oil in them. So it became um, synonymous, synonymous with con man. I suppose. Anyway, so John Pemberton wanted to create a drink like this. He came up with Pemberton's French wine cola. Now in that drink, he had a number of things. He had coca and coca wine. Coca, of course, is where we get cocaine from. It's an addictive substance. And coca wine is basically alcohol with cocaine in it. He had a cola nut, which has caffeine in it. And he had a plant called Damiana, which has quite a bitter taste. Anyway, he mixed all these ingredients together and he made his Pemberton's French wine cola and started selling it. It was moderately successful. However, in the 1870s, 1880s, temperance started to take off in America. Temperance is the belief that people shouldn't take alcohol, people shouldn't drink. Now these temperance societies became huge and a lot of alcohol was actually banned. A lot of people couldn't, wouldn't buy alcohol. So John Pemberton, he realized he was have to, going to have to remake his drink. He'd have to make it without the coca wine. So he did. He basically tried a lot of different substances, a lot of different ingredients, and he came up with his cola. Now in the beginning, it was just a drink. However, in 1886, he accidentally mixed the syrup with some soda water and made the fizzy coke that we have today, of course. He started selling the syrup. The very first shop that bought his syrup was called Jacob's Pharmacy, 1886. They started selling it. But of course, it was sold as a medicine. It was a nerve tonic. It was supposed to help headaches, stomach, in, stomach ache, indigestion, a lot of things like that, impotence. It was supposed to basically cure anything that was wrong with you. It was a, a medicine. Now, in 1887, a man called Asa Griggs Candler, who's going to become huge in the Coca-Cola story, he became interested in this product and he started buying bits of the company from Pemberton. Now, 1888, about two years after it starts, Coca-Cola is being sold in four stores, only four shops. Of course, it's sold as a syrup. What people did back then was that you had um, soda fountains. You had shops that would sell drinks, restaurants or cafes. People would go in there. The shop assistant would have the syrup for the drink. They would mix the syrup in a glass and they would add soda water, fizzy water. And that was how you got your Coke. You couldn't buy cola. Only the shop could give it to you. Now, 1888, the business of Coca-Cola is owned by three people. Each person owns one third. Candler owns a third. Pemberton, John Pemberton owns a third. And Pemberton's son, Charlie Pemberton, also owns a third. Now, Candler, he wants to purchase, he wants to buy Coca-Cola. He wants to take it off. He wants to start increasing the number of shops and sales, but he can't do that. Now, in August uh, 1888, John Pemberton dies. And uh, Asa Griggs, Candler, he thinks, well, this is an opportunity. He thinks he can buy the business, but he can't. He still owns his one third. The other two thirds goes to Charlie Pemberton, Pemberton's son. Now, he was an alcoholic. He was not a great person, I suppose, but um, he will not sell his part of the business. He will not sell it. However, in 1894, conveniently, he dies. And through various business deals, through paying off various people, um, Asa Kandler is able to purchase the whole of Coca-Cola. Everything he spends comes to about $2,300. He buys Coca-Cola for $2,300. When we hear stories like that, we think, wow, he bought this multi-billion dollar company for such a small amount of money. But of course, we're using hindsight when we talk about that. Back at the time, Coca-Cola was not what it is now. Yet we do that a lot. Um, when uh, 
Howard Saltz bought Starbucks from the three people that started it for such a small amount of money, we think, whoa. When, um, Coca, uh, when McDonald's was bought from the brothers, people think, whoa. But of course, we're applying hindsight. The companies were nothing like they are now. The people that bought them made them what they are. So Asa Griggs Candler, he is now the sole owner of Coca-Cola. He starts doing something that basically um, shapes Coca-Cola from there on. He starts advertising like crazy. He starts pumping almost all of the profits from the Coca-Cola business back into advertising. He puts the Coca-Cola name on anything, clocks, calendars, buckets, uh, posters, signs, any way you can think of, he puts the Coca-Cola name. Why? Because if you see Coca-Cola, you start thinking about Coca-Cola. And then when you go into your shop, when you go into your soda fountain, and you, the person asks you what you want to drink, well, Coca-Cola is the first thing that comes to mind, of course. He starts giving coupons away, coupons in newspapers or handing out coupons on the street. You get a cheaper glass of Coke, you're going to go into the shop and buy Coke. So he starts pumping almost all of the profits back into advertising. And that is something that Coca-Cola still does today. Okay, thanks to Asa Kandler, by 1894, Coca-Cola is in every state across America. It's still sold only at soda fountains, of course. Coke sells the syrup with instructions of exactly how much syrup should be put into a glass and mixed with soda water. 1899, a man called Joseph A. Biedenheim, Biedenham, sorry, he comes up with the bottling idea. He noticed that a lot of people at the soda fountain wanted to take Coca-Cola home. They wanted to drink it at home with their meals, but of course there was no way to do that. He came up with a system of bottling the Coca-Cola. He came up with glass bottles, he came up with a way of sterilizing them, and a way of putting the, the Coke in and sealing it. So once the glass bottle is invented, of course it takes off. Asa Kandler realizes, of course, that if people can take Coke home, what are they going to do? They're going to buy more Coke. They're not only going to drink it when they go to the soda fountain, they're going to drink it all day round. So bottling starts taking off. Now one thing Coca-Cola did and still does is they don't own the bottling plants. The bottles, the Coca-Cola bottlers are franchises. You can apply for a franchise in any country. And what that company does is they buy the Coca-Cola syrup from Coca-Cola and then they mix it to a specified amount in the bottles and they sell the bottles. Coca-Cola doesn't actually own the bottles you are buying, they just own the syrup. Okay, so um, bottling takes off and Coca-Cola starts to increase. Advertising is still insane, advertising all the time. Then World War II is a huge, huge step for Coca-Cola. They managed to secure a deal where Coca-Cola is given to all of the soldiers. Coca-Cola is shipped to everywhere that people are fighting. And from this point on, Coca-Cola basically becomes connected with the American image. If you see American soldiers fighting in other countries and they have Coca-Cola, you start to connect Coca-Cola to America. And it starts to take off. It starts to become more than just a drink. So, where is Coca-Cola now? Well, around the world, we buy 1.7 billion bottles of Coca-Cola every day. The company is worth $74 billion. There are 2.8 million vending machines around the world. Coca-Cola, the company, owns 500, more than 500 brands around the world, many different kinds of drinks. There are 275 bottling plants around the world. So Coca-Cola is huge, as you know. Who drinks the most Coke? Which country do you think? Mm, Mexico. Mexico, Chile, and America. People think America would be number one, but it's actually not. Mexico is number one. Now, Coke, of course, has um, a lot of problems associated with it. One of them is obesity and a tooth decay. I'm, I'm sure you've seen pictures like this. There is a huge amount of sugar in Coca-Cola. That's one of the reasons why we like it. But people drink Coca-Cola not thinking that they're just empty calories. I mean, if you eat a Big Mac, yeah, there's lots of fats and lots of bad things in there, but you're also getting some protein, some good things. If you drink two liters of Coca-Cola every day, you're only getting sugar. So this is a, a cause of obesity. One of the reasons for obesity in countries like America, you have um, enormous cup sizes these days, you, like double gulps, these giant, almost two liter size cups. Anyway, obesity is another topic for another day. So, <clears throat> ah, running out of time. So how does Coca-Cola exist? How does Coca-Cola keep going the way they are? Well, they're still using Asa Griggs Candler's idea. They're still pumping almost all of their profits back into advertising. 
Almost all of their profits goes into advertising. Every year they spend about $3 billion on advertising. That's more than Apple and Microsoft put together. Basically, all of their money goes into advertising. Everywhere you go, you see Coca-Cola. Out of all the brand names in the world, Coca-Cola is the most recognized around the world. There are very few people on our planet who do not know what Coca-Cola is. Ah, I ran out of time. A little bit more. Okay. Now, one of the problems Coca-Cola is facing now is that sales are stagnating. In the world, everybody drinks Coca-Cola. In the developed world, there are very few people who are going to start drinking Coca-Cola. Everybody already drinks it. So Coca-Cola has to find new markets. Now what Coca-Cola are doing at the moment is they're in entering um, Africa, uh, some of the poorer countries in Africa. They're entering into Africa, they're coming up with sponsorship deals with schools, with shops, with industries, and they are also um, fixing the infrastructure. Coca-Cola is putting money into countries to build up their roads, to build up their infrastructure, the railway lines. Why would they do that? Is it from the goodness of their own heart? Is it altruism? No, of course not. If you have better roads, if you have better railway systems, you can distribute Coca-Cola much more easily. You can sell Coca-Cola much more easily. So um, Coca-Cola is doing some background work, some groundwork to try and fix up these countries in order to sell more Coke. That's basically it. They are a business, of course. However, I mean, it is having positive impact. It is having positive effects on certain countries, even if it is just for profit. Okay, nearly finished. So, um, Coca-Cola is recognized around the world. Coca-Cola is globalization, one might say. However, people don't feel the same way about Coca-Cola as they do about, say, a company like Starbucks. When you see Starbucks shops appearing all around the world, people think, oh, globalization, America, Starbucks is taking over the world, this is terrible. But we don't think the same way with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is associated with America, was associated with America, but now it's just a drink. Coca-Cola has become to us what water is. We don't think about Coca-Cola as American. We don't think about Coca-Cola as a giant company taking over our world. We think about Coca-Cola purely as a drink. It has become to us basically what water is. So Coca-Cola has managed to do what Starbucks has not managed to do. They have managed to become more than just a company. They have managed to become something that we cannot live without. And that started because of Asa Griggs Candler. And that's Coca-Cola. Thank you for listening. Don't forget, if you click in the link in the if you click on the link in the description below here, you can go to my homepage, stevenaskew.com, and you can find uh, the transcript for this talk. You can find questions, multiple choice and essay type. You can try and answer them. You can improve your English. There are answers there as well. And you can download the MP3. If you try the questions, if you work, if you practice, if you listen, your English will improve, I hope. Anyway, thank you. I'll talk to you next week. Goodbye.